morning to the book of Romans chapter 8. Book of Romans chapter 8. We'll be continuing our study of this. Uh, this week I kind of wondered how long that we had been in Romans chapter 8. And I picked up, I believe it was uh, my wife's Bible, and she had made a little notation in the side there. And we started out on, I think it was July the 7th. So we've had four months in just one uh, chapter, but it's a lot of chapter. <laughs> uh, both in the breadth of its truth and the depth of its truth. And so as those that have been visiting with us for some time now understand, we do not get in a hurry as it is to uh, teach the Word of God because these are eternal truths. Amen. Need to understand. Uh, they deserve our close attention, I believe. As I've said before, I don't think that we are to read the Word of God like a the comic strips or the sports page or uh, whatever you might read in your Kindle uh, in this day and time. I believe that we are to give careful thought and attention to it. We're going to pick up again and read, uh, begin reading with verse 31. We have covered basically the first four verses of this last section of Scripture in Romans 8. And we will begin this morning at verse 35, but I will begin reading again at verse 31 and then at verse 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God for us, who against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? I tell it there said it is God who justifies. We can just basically say God justifies. Amen. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, or as it stands written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So here in verse 35, Paul continues what I said is really an exaltation here. A praise, if you will. A statement of praise. A statement of exaltation for God's plan of salvation. It's almost like he's overflowing with his joy in these truths which he has been privileged to write. He was just an instrument. These didn't come just out of the mind of Paul because he was a learned man. As we talked about this morning in Sunday school, he was a man moved by God, by the Holy Spirit to speak God's Word. Man. He was an instrument. Right. And you can see here how he is seemingly filled to the brim and overflowing with this truth that God has spoken here through Him. And so what we are finding here as we come down through this is that Paul uh, speaks here with another question. But in reality it is a series of questions that are statements of affirmation that no one chosen by God in His eternal plan of salvation can ever be unchosen or separated from that salvation purpose by God in eternity past. It is a, an impossibility. And so he begins by asking this question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now there are some that question this and say even that this a word that is used here could even be translated, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, and say that's what it really should be translated as because that what follows are a list of circumstances that come upon believers here 
in the in this the rest of this verse. But in my thinking, and I looked at some of the different translations here, they all translated who. And my thinking in this, and it's really my conviction that it might be that what Paul has in mind as we get through this is that the enemies of Christ and the enemies of the church and the enemies of Christians is really speaking about these enemies, their part in bringing some of these things upon believers. Uh, the who question then, uh, I think, is appropriate. I think that he really we should leave it as who. He, who Amen. shall separate us from the love of Christ. Uh -huh. And I think the who is appropriate because Christ made it clear in His earthly ministry that believers would face persecution from the world. It's interesting that we had it brought up this morning that this was like the International Week of Prayer or International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And we in the United States of America were kind of insulated from that somewhat speaking, to be perfectly honest about it. But if you read any of the the newsletters from any of our missionaries, you understand that persecution is definitely still going on against Christians and against preachers and against missionaries throughout this world. It's not like everywhere else like what it is in the United States of America. And so I think the who is appropriate. And we read that passage this morning for our scripture reading where Jesus basically said, you know, they've hated me, they're going to hate you also. And as they persecuted Christ, the enemies of the cross, the enemies of Christ, the enemies of the truth of God, and the gospel are going to persecute believers. It has been that way, really, We want to, sometimes we say, throughout the gospel age, but even from before the gospel age, in the Old Testament, the true people of God have been persecuted. And we will see that. Now, when we read this here, when he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, he's not really saying that there is anyone that is going to separate us from the love of Christ, but there, there are those personalities that would attempt to do that and would attack Christians. Now, first of all, we understand that Satan is an enemy of believers. Now, as I hope you understand at this particular point in time, Satan is a singular personality. He is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all at one time. You, know, you hear people say things like, well, you know, all over the globe, well, the devil made me do it, or the devil did this to me, or did that to, to this one. And it's most likely that one, maybe one of his cohorts did it instead. But we understand that the leader, the lead enemy of the church is Satan himself or Lucifer, Lucifer or the devil, we would say. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 18 that he is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. He is definitely attacking believers. He's attacking the work of the gospel in this world. And those sufferings that Peter speaks of there in verse 9, that these sufferings that are coming upon believers, I believe in many cases are uh, the influence of Satan's attack upon them. Amen. You know, and I quoted, I believe it was this verse last week in Luke 22 and 31, where Jesus said to Peter, he said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. And I pray for you that your faith fail not. So Satan certainly is one who would try to separate us from the love of Christ, but of course he cannot. But he is the primary accuser of believers, the leader and the head of all who opposed the church in ages past and in this day and time and in the future. And until he is put away, as we read about in Revelation 20 this morning, he shall continue to buffet the church and believers and the work of the gospel. Right. Right. But we must recognize something else that the enemies of the church and the enemies of Christ and the enemies of believers are many. Amen. Are many. Amen. In fact, there are more enemies of Christ and more enemies of the truth and the gospel than there are friends of the gospel. Right. The scripture says many are called but few are chosen. There's few that are really the friends of Christ that really believe the real gospel. 
Scripture speaks of wide is the gate, and many there are that go down that road to destruction, but there's the, the road that leads to Christ is narrow, and few there be that find it. So the enemies of Christ and the enemies of His people are many. We kid ourselves if we believe that most people uh, are really friends of Christ and friends of the church. They really are not. But we must recognize that there are many of these enemies. And, and Jesus spoke of this often. And there's many scriptures that I can that I can refer to this morning. There, but let me just refer to a couple. And if you don't want to turn to these, that's fine. You want to write these down. That's fine. Also, but in Matthew chapter 10. And there in verse 16, Jesus said to his disciples, He said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now what defense does a sheep have against a wolf? Well, not much. Except for the shepherd is guarding the sheep. So that's our protection. But he said, therefore, what he's saying here is the natural enemy of sheep are wolves, and there are many of those out there. He said, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of them, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But he said, and then he goes on down to verse 21. Now, brothers want to deliver your brother to death. A father is child. Children will rise up against his parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. So, so he's saying here that there are going to be many enemies. He was speaking here particularly, at least at that point in time, to the apostles. And what he said was true. They were delivered up before councils and before governors, before ruling authorities. Right. And because of what they spoke in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In John 17, <laughs> there in verses 14 and 15, Jesus in His great high priestly prayer spoke of this animosity toward the people of God. He said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. You see, when we are saved, when we become believers, that just as the apostles were left in the world, we are left in the world. But we are not left alone in the world. <laughs> He is with us. He is defending us. He's at the right hand of the Father as we've already noted last week. And very soon after Christ's ascension back to the Father, after Pentecost and the empowering of the church, we see the attacks that came upon the church. You see it in Stephen's death that he was stoned to death. In fact, they made, he made them so angry by the truth that he spoke that they, it says they rushed upon him and gnashed upon him, bit upon him with their teeth. They became as wild animals. Yes. And even Saul of Tarsus, it doesn't say that he joined in that, but he stood there and he was consenting unto his death. There was early persecution of the church as we see in the book of Acts. You look over in Acts chapter 8. And there in verses 1 through 3 it says Saul was consenting to his death. Speaking of Stephen, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. There was an attack upon the church. And if you go a little farther down into chapter 12 of Acts, in verses 1 through 5, it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. It says he arrested him, he put him in prison, he delivered him up to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. So we see there the attack upon the church. And if you go throughout the book of Acts, you will see that. We're not going to go through all of that, but you will see that, that the attacks upon the church are upon God's people. 
And so it has been seen in persecutions against Christians throughout history that men and government and religious authorities attack the people of God. Particularly in the last 2,000 years, we've seen it obvious, the attacks upon the church. Rome, the Roman government, the atrocities that they committed against Christians are horrific. It's just beyond what you would think men could do to other men. Men and women and children being cast into the Roman Colosseum. I cannot hardly help but thinking, you know, that Roman Colosseum that is still over there to this day and time, but I can hardly think of that place but think about the blood of Christians that has been spilled in that place. I think about the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Some say well, we shouldn't say anything about other churches, but the blood is on their hands. Amen. Of how that they have persecuted Christians throughout history. The Dark Ages. Christians having to hide in the woods and the caves because of persecution. During the time of Reformation, both in Europe and in England, about Christians that were what we would call drawn and quartered by horses and were decapitated and were burned alive because they would not recant their testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Right. Even in more modern times, the hatred of communism for Christians and the persecution of communism upon Christians. And even in this day and time, the Chinese government and their persecution of Christians. And even, even perhaps more subtle or not so subtle anymore, in our society, in our days, the attacks of human secularism and atheism and evolutionism upon Christians and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the person of Christ. Amen. They are not tolerant of Christianity. And it becomes more and more evident as time goes by their intolerance of Christianity. Amen. They desire to eradicate Christianity from the public view in whatever way that they can. Right. Amen. So you see, the world is not a friend of Christians. And so this is why Paul says, who shall separate us from the, from the love of Christ is because he recognized that the enemies of Christ and Christians are real personalities. They are real people. They are real flesh and blood entities. But he says, of course, that these things shall not. We understand that. But the love of Christ, he says here, we really need to examine that phrase. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, when we speak of love, we're not speaking about the, you know, the really uh, syrupy, sappy things we see in romantic comedies and that kind of thing. Now, I'll be honest with you. I love, I, I like a good love story. Maybe that's not very manly, you know, like that. But I, I like those stories. But that's not the kind of love that we're talking about here. The love of Christ he speaks of is agape love. It is holy love. Amen. It is Amen. immutable, unchanging, eternal, pure love is what he's talking about here. He is talking about the love of Christ which he has had basically for his people from before the foundation of the world as we have studied about. As we have looked at. And this, when we think of the love of Christ, we need to think of it in this way, that he's not talking about our love of Christ. He's talking about the love of Christ for us. Because we did not love him first. We respond in love only because the love of Christ has been poured out upon us and in us. We have the Spirit of Christ. We have the, the Holy Spirit in us and the, and the first fruit of the Spirit that it speaks of there is love, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. But there's a love there, a love of Christ. And, and it's not a love that was demonstrated first by us, but by God toward man. 
And the idea of the classic Greek there is that this is charity. I love the word charity. I love that word there. And it is the charity of God toward man. It's His benevolence toward man. Not doing what we deem or what we necessarily desire. We didn't even, when, when God chose to, to love us, even looking down through the ages, it was not that He saw looked and said, oh, these people are really going to desire to love me and know me. No. He did it in spite of the fact that we were rebellious people that had no love for Him, that had a love for the world. But this is what He determined was needed, is that He pour out His love and show His love to us. Amen. John 3.16, as I quoted before, for God so loved the world, He initiated this love. Then in 1 John chapter 4, there in verses 9 and 10, John writes, and this the love of God was manifested toward us initially, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. This was the demonstration of the love of God. And no one, no power, no personality, no government, no entity of any kind can separate us from the love of Christ. This is what he is saying here to the people of God. Right. It is unchangeable. It is eternal. It is unbreakable. Amen. God will never say to you, I have fallen out of love with you. <laughs> Men and women may say that to a spouse in time, but God will never say that to his children because it is eternal. It is holy. It's based upon His unfailing promise and His unfailing authority and His unfailing power. But not only will no one be able to separate us from the love of Christ, but Paul says no circumstance of life will be able to separate us from Christ's love. There is no circumstance of life that will ever come that will separate me from the love of Christ. And I want us, before we get into this list here, and there's seven things there that he mentions. But before we get into this list, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that Paul was not speaking just theoretically. He was speaking from experience. These were all things that Paul had experienced. Have you ever had somebody that you tried to they're going through some difficulty and you try to say, oh, well, you know, I feel for you. And then say, oh, you just don't understand. You just, you, you just don't know what you're talking about. You've never, you haven't been through this like I have. And perhaps we have not. But let me say something. Paul had been through all of these things. He knew it experientially. In 2 Corinthians... Chapter 11, he gives a whole list of things basically that he had been through. And this is just one of the places that he talks about this. This is the one that I've chosen. There are other places where he talks about his persecutions. But in 2 Corinthians 11, 23-30, he, he speaks of this. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. That means he'd been beaten so many times he couldn't remember in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, in, in threat of death. From the Jews, five times I received 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And day and a night I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak. Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. See, he was just demonstrating there that Paul had been through all of these things. Amen. He's been there. Amen. 
And I, I doubt really seriously that any of us in this building have been through what, anything close to what Paul But here are these seven circumstances which Paul speaks of that he had experienced. Number one, he says, shall tribulation. Tribulation here is a word from the Greek which means to crush, to compress. It means a grievous affliction or distress that comes upon a man or a woman or upon the soul. You see, Paul knew what it was like to have great tribulation that it pressed down so hard on you that the very weight of it you thought was more than you could bear. And this word is used over in Matthew chapter 13. You see, the parable of the sower. It is very often tribulation that casts the dividing line of who are really believers and who are not. And it is in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 21 when Jesus was explaining or talking about the parable of the sower here, He used this. He said, here that he and who endures only for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. When that tribulation and that persecution comes, he says that is where, that's the real uh, test of whether a man really loves Christ. Right. Or where the his stand for the word of God. Right. But there was great tribulation that had come upon the Apostle Paul. You look again over in the book of Acts that speaks much of the persecution of, of, of the apostles and of the church. And here it speaks of, of Peter and in Acts 11 and 19 and, and the church here. It says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. You see, there was a persecution, a crushing that came upon the church. But it did not destroy the church. It did not destroy their testimony for Christ. Yeah. In Acts chapter 14, there in verse 22, it says, Here was Paul, who had just, by the way, if you go back up a few verses from this, he had just been stoned and left for dead. He said, when they had preached the gospel of that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. You see, this is one of the things I think is wrong with basically the modern day church. It's easy to be a Christian. It's easy to be a member of a church in this day and time. There is no tribulation for the testimony of Christ. It is just an accepted thing that you're a member of a church somewhere. But it is tribulation that will separate the pretenders from those that are true believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when that tribulation comes, as Scripture bears witness, and as history bears witness, tribulation will not separate the believer from his testimony for Christ. In fact, it will evidence in his life his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So therefore, the Apostle Paul could say, tribulation will not separate us from the love of Christ. And the next word that he uses is distress. Now this is a word that very often is used in the Greek with this same word that is used in the Greek for tribulation. But the word means to be in or fit in a narrow space. To be placed in great distress or what we might say dire straits. Now sometimes, you know, let's be honest, we don't like to be in, dis in distress, do we? We like to be comfortable. We like to be comfortable. But for Christians, we don't need to be too comfortable in this world. And we're not to be too comfortable in this world. We are going to be in distress as a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, Paul told Timothy. 
We don't like to be put in these narrow places or to be put in a corner, but sometimes our stand for Christ and His truth will do that. Example, again, in the book of Acts. Remember the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon the church and there was great revival going on and souls were being saved by the thousands, but any time God begins to work, of course, Satan is going to work also in those who support Him. And so what we're told is basically that Peter and John got arrested. And so they were commanded in that particular passage of Scripture, verse 18 of Acts 4, says they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now, let me say this. For Christians, it is our duty to be obedient to civil authorities, is it not? And to the government. Unless it violates the command of God. The Lord Jesus Christ had already commanded them, you go into the world and preach the gospel. Right. And so when they got this command, it says, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you can be the judge of that. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. You see, they had been put into distressing place in a corner because of their testimony for Christ, because of their stand for the gospel, but they say, well, we're going to stand with God. You guys can do what you want to. Whatever comes, what may, we will take that, but we're going to stand with God and with the gospel. Right. But not all of the distresses that come to our lives as Christians are because somebody has put us there. Well, let me rephrase that. They are because somebody has put us there, but it's not always an enemy. Sometimes it's God that's put us in a distressful place. Sometimes we're sovereignly put into distress by God. Point in question. The Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. A passage of Scripture I'm sure that all of you are familiar with. And Paul, I believe, and he's talking about here in the first part of chapter 12, receiving a, a great revelation thing from God. But he says in verse 7 there, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, very often the distresses that we have in life, like perhaps a physical malady, such as chronic pain, such as a heart condition, such as cancer, such as some financial downfall, sometimes that distressing place is sovereignly, we are sovereignly put there by God. And how is it that we respond to that. Because I've heard people before that have been put in places that call themselves believers and where they basically say, well, if God loved me, I would not be in this place. But you see something, beloved? Those distresses do not mean that Christ does not love us. They are the proving ground of the sufficiency of His grace. Now, I'm not saying that Paul immediately said, well, praise God, I'm putting this distress in place. <laughs> and we don't do that either. It says he prayed earnestly three times, God, take this away from me. And finally he said, Paul, you might as well stop praying for that because this is where you're going to be for the rest of your day. This thorn in the flesh is going to be there for you. And very often we are given thorns in the flesh 
that we might as well stop praying for God to take it away from us because we're going to have them for the rest of our lives here on earth. But we need to understand that the love of Christ is not broken when that distressing situation is brought into our lives or we are put in that distressing place. That's right. That's right. Then he says, also the next thing is persecution. Persecution, the next word is. Tribulation, distress, persecution. And the word here means affliction for the cause of Christ, basically. That we are afflicted for the name of Christ. And as I've said, we don't like to be distressed. We don't like to be in tribulation. We don't like persecution either. It's not a natural thing. But the Lord told us to rejoice in that, did He not? Yeah. And to rejoice in that, let me say, that can only be done if you are a child of God and you have the Spirit of God. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when they revile you and they persecute you and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you amen you see we are blessed when we are persecuted we don't always see it as a blessing but it is a blessing to be, well, to be persecuted along with Christ. Right. And Christ had foretold His disciples as we read there in John chapter 15. And we, and as John 15 says, and we spoke of John 15, that persecution wouldn't come. And Paul knew much of this persecution. As we already spoke of over there in 2 Corinthians. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verses 11 through 13, he spoke of this. He said, to the present hour we both hunger and thirst and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless and we labor working with our hands, being reviled, we blessed, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat, we have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things. And now, to the world we are just dirt to be scraped off the floor. But we endure it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that it could not separate him from the love of Christ. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verses 8 through 10, Paul, when speaking of these things, he says, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. <laughs> Struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. You see it is when we are going through these things that the life of Christ and the love of Christ is demonstrated in our lives above everything else. It is seen as an opportunity for the world to see that no matter what we are going through, as far as persecution, as far as tribulation, as far as, far as distress, that God's love still is, is in us. It's upon us that we have not been forsaken by God. And he says famine. The word here means to be in hunger. Now, Let's be honest, we don't really know anything of this. To be honest, to be in hunger, to be in despair for food. I cannot ever remember in my lifetime uh, because of my financial situation or of some any other situation not having enough to eat. But for Christians in that day, because of persecution, that was a real issue because of their faith. And Paul spoke of this in the verses that I've already read in 1 Corinthians 4 and 11, 2 Corinthians 11 and 27, that Paul had been in hunger because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. But even in that, he said, even though I have been hungry, even though I've been in want of physical food, I knew that the love of Christ had not forsaken me. That He still loved me. 
Then he brings in this idea of nakedness. The idea here is not of literal nakedness, but of being destitute of basic clothing. Really, another thing that we don't know anything about. I mean, how can we in this day? When there are clothing stores on every corner. Everywhere. And I understand that there are people that don't have clothing like most of us do and, and do have needs. But Paul was speaking about here those that didn't have good clothing to keep them from the elements. They didn't have good housing. There were other necessities that they did not have. And in fact, our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of that. And the birds of the air have their nest, He said in Luke chapter 9. Foxes, the whole, foxes have their holes to live in, but the Son of Man does not have a place that He can call home where He can rest His head. You see, so we might be tempted somehow to think that when somebody is in need of these things that God has forsaken them, but we need to remember that even in the midst of that kind of circumstance that God still loves His people. He still is with us still remembers our needs. And he says the sixth thing is peril. Peril. What this means is to be in danger. This was certainly something that Paul knew a lot about. Almost from the very outset of his ministry, he was in peril. If you look back over in Acts 9 and 23, it speaks there of from the time that he testified of Christ but immediately the Jews said, well, we can't have this. We're going to kill him. He had to escape from town because of the danger upon his life. In Acts 14 and 5, there was a plan to stone him. And then in Acts 14, verses 19 through 20, Paul was stoned and he was left for dead. They thought, oh, we got him. We've stamped him out. But it says that he rose up. Now, there are some that think that he really was killed and that God raised him up. I don't know. I don't want to read too much into that. But we see there the peril that Paul was constantly in. And if you look over there in, as we've read 2 Corinthians 11 and 26, seven times this word peril is used. You see that. You see, you see there, he said, in perils of waters. It means upon the oceans he was in peril. In perils of robbers when he was out upon the way. In perils by my own country and the Jews. He was in perils of them. He was in perils of the Gentiles. He was in perils of the city, the wilderness, in the sea, and among false brethren. There was no place that Paul was not in danger. He was in danger everywhere that he went. He had very few friends that he could really depend upon. He was in danger constantly as a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, even in this, that we are not separated from the love of Christ, even when we are in danger. Then seventh, the sword. This basically means in the Greek, an assassin's sword or dagger. To be in constant danger of death. Paul was in constant danger of death. And in that day and time, I'm sure many of those that he spoke to here in Romans were in constant danger of death from the enemies of Christ, the enemies of the cross. And Paul would eventually die for the testimony of Christ. And many through the 2,000 years since Christ's ascension back to the Father have died for their testimony. And the faithful died before. For him before that, if you go to Hebrews 11, 36 and verse 4, 40, it talks there about them being hung and, and sawn asunder. Why? Because of their testimony for God and for His truth. Right. But Paul said, even in those things, even when we are in the sword and when we die at the hands of a swordsman, guess what? They're doing us a favor. Because he said to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And when Paul approached that time of death, he said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. He looked forward to the day that he would be with Christ. 
And certainly he knew, no, the sword was not something that would separate me from the love of Christ. In fact, it would deliver me into the very presence of the one who had died for me and shed his blood for me. Amen. So all these things, you see, we shall not be separated from the love of Christ. Amen. And Paul said, in light of these things, in verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. This is a quotation of Psalm 44 and 23. You see, you want to know what the world really thinks of Christianity? We view you Christians as sheep for the slaughter. We believe that all you're good for is the slaughtering block. But the reality for believers is that until the return of Christ for His church, until our glorification, Christians are going to suffer persecution. We should not be surprised that the world does not love us. They do not love the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For all those, as I said, who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We should not think it strange that these things are coming upon us. Mm -hmm. We should not think that when distresses come, when trials come, when tribulations come, when famine comes, that Christ does not love us anymore. No. No. A thousand times no. Even in the midst of these things, because we know that Christ has sent His Son to die for our sins, we know that His love is eternal for us. No matter Amen. what may come in this life. Amen. And the life of Christ is exhibited in the life of His people, even in the midst of these things. Yes, May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the love of Christ today. The eternal, unchangeable love of Christ. It is not like the love of a man or a woman. It is so far beyond that we cannot even imagine. Father, we thank You today that even though in those times that we might be unfaithful, even in those times that we might be disobedient that your love for us is steadfast and remains Father we thank you for your love we thank you for the love that was shown to your people upon the cross of Calvary upon the cross at Golgotha as our Lord and Savior died for our sins and Lord as we approach this table today Father, may we come reverently and quietly to this place and think upon the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins. Amen. In your name I pray. Amen.